subject this morning is can we prove that the Bible is scientifically accurate? And we can. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Someone may ask, how can we know the Bible is scientifically accurate? Does it conflict with science? Is there errors in the Bible? How can we know that it is scientifically accurate? Well, first of all, you need to read it. Then you will know. But secondly, you can know the Bible is the Word of God by the accuracy of its statements concerning science. That will be the burden of our message this morning to show that the statements of the Bible prove themselves to be the Word of God by its accuracy concerning science. Now the Bible is not so much a book to tell us how the heavens go, but how to go to heaven. It speaks of a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned. I illustrate by a train dashing down the tracks at 60 miles per hour, running through a signal and crashing with the loss of many lives. We are dashing down the track of life at 60 heartbeats a minute and we are on our way to glory. Can we be assured that the Bible gives us an answer that we might rest our hope in the infallible Word of God? Science once thought that the earth preceded the heavens. But Moses said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If the Bible isn't the Word of God, how did Moses know that heaven was created before earth? The ancient Hindus, for example, taught that the earth was supported on a platform made from the backs of elephants. These in turn stood on the shell of a mighty tortoise. And the tortoise stood on the coil of a great snake. Though where the snake stood, none of them knew. And they said when the elephants shook themselves, that's what caused earthquakes. Now that was science in its day. Nobody would accept that today as scientific. Now the Bible is first of all, astronomically correct. Early astronomers gave different views of the earth. Some said the world was flat. Others said it looked like a table. Some said it was square. While others said it resembled a drum. And some said it was supported by pillars and that there were not more than 1,600 stars. But the Bible disproves all of those false scientific theories which people held, the ancients believed, by teaching us that the world is round. And of course nobody would argue with that today with the astronauts bringing pictures back of the earth showing that it is round. The Bible says exactly what modern science and astronomy says today that the world is round, is hung in space, and the stars are without number. In Isaiah 40, 22, which was written more than 2,000 years ago, Isaiah said, It is He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. How did Isaiah know long, long ago that God sits on the circle of the earth. Isaiah knew that the earth was a globe hanging in space. In Psalm 1906, His going forth is from the end of heaven and His circuit 
to the ends of it. You see, the Bible was way ahead of science. Job 26, 7 tells us about Earth's suspension in space. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, that is a place where there are no stars, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now that's what the Bible told us thousands of years ago. He hangeth the earth upon nothing. Today we've been around it in, 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 in telecameras all the way around it. And there's nothing holding it up except God. God upholds all things by the word of His power, the Bible says. He stretches out the north over the empty place. Science has just recently discovered an empty place up through the Milky Way that has no stars. A great tunnel. They can't explain it. Job knew all about it more than 2,000 years ago. When he said, He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. See, the Bible is a very scientific book and it never contradicts true science. Sometimes science contradicts the Bible and when science contradicts the Bible, you can put it down, they are wrong. The Bible is never wrong. It has never been wrong. It will never be wrong. You cannot find one scientific statement in the Bible that conflicts with true science. The ancients thought that the stars could be numbered. The astronomer Hipparchus in 125 AD counted 1,022 stars. Ptolemy counted four more and came up with 1,626 stars. 1,400 years later, Galileo said they are too numerous to count. Cannot be counted. Sir John Herschel invented a telescope by which you could read a newspaper 25 miles away. Look now toward heaven, the Bible says, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. Now you cannot. And yet God knows the names of every one of those stars. Octurus, Taurus, Net, all of the stars. He named them. He knows where they are. He created them. Now the ancients insisted that the moon was larger than the sun. But Sir James Jeans, an astronomer, proved that the sun is five million times larger than the moon. In Genesis 1.16, God made two great lights. The greater light, that's the sun, to rule the day. And the lesser light, that's the moon, to rule the night. He made the stars also. So the Bible is right in line with modern science. Science used to believe that the moon was a luminous body like the sun. That it shined. Now we know that it does not shine. It only reflects the light of the sun. Job knew that. In chapter 25 he wrote Behold, even the moon it shineth not. Now science used to teach that the moon shined. Now they say it doesn't. It reflects the light of the sun. But Job said the moon it shineth not. You see, the reason Job knew that is because he wrote by divine inspiration. God gave him that and he wrote it down. And God was right. The moon doesn't shine. Now that's going to be sad for people who like to sit on the front porch and sing by the light of the silvery moon. There's no light from the silvery moon. The Bible even confirms the copper Copernican system which we all accept today. That is the belief that the earth rotates around the sun and the planets revolve in orbit around the sun. And the Bible confirms that. And then not only is it astronomically 
Geolo it's geologically correct. The Bible teachings are in perfect harmony with modern geology. Great authorities on geology from Harvard and from Yale University have now said that the story of creation in the first chapter of Genesis is in perfect harmony with the teachings of geology. And the order of creation, they said, is faultless. Now why do they say that? They have to because they know it's true. And science verifies it. And the Bible said it all the time. In Genesis 1-2, Moses wrote, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, Moses and science are right together. And they will always be together when science catches up with the Bible. Thirdly, it is psychologically correct. The ancient students of psychology thought the seat of the intellect was in the blood, in the heart, in the chest, or the abdomen. But the Bible never agreed with that. The Bible puts the brain as the seat of the personality. The functions and the powers of the mind the conscience, the memory, imagination are all centered in the brain. Modern science agrees now with what the Bible said about it. Luke 10, 27, Jesus said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul and all thy strength and all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself with all thy mind. So psychologically, the Bible is in line with modern science. Fourthly, historically and geographically correct, over 5,000 places spoken of in the Bible have been confirmed by archaeology that the Bible is correct in every statement it makes about places all over the world. 5,000 places are mentioned in the Bible that are all confirmed by modern geology. The Bible is never wrong. An archaeological excavation recently unearthed a clay tablet. Now, the infidels used to scoff at the Bible because the Bible spoke of a king named Sargon. And they said, in history, we cannot find any reference to Sargon. So Sargon is just a figment of the Bible's imagination. You cannot prove, they said, in history that there was any such a king named Sargon. But to their dismay, a few years ago, the archaeologists dug up a clay tablet in which Sargon, the king, boasted that he shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. And again... The infidels were proved wrong. The Bible was proved to be right by archaeology. And then fifthly, the Bible is medically correct. In 1628, Dr. William Harvey, a noted English physician, discovered the circulation of the blood in the human body. He stated that it circles the body every three minutes and it runs through the body constantly refreshing the flesh of the body Moses knew that a long time ago when he wrote in Leviticus 17 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood I have given it to you on the altar as an atonement for your souls now this was written 3,000 years before man discovered it. God knew it and wrote it down long ago. By the way, science used to teach that when a person was sick, you would cut him and bleed him. That's how George Washington died. His barber cut him with a razor and bled him thinking that letting out blood would overcome the illness that Washington had. But modern science knows now that we don't need to let blood out, we need to get blood in. 
And in World War II, we discovered that if we could get blood plasma into a wounded soldier, he would live. So the science had it backward. But the Bible had it right when it said the life of all flesh is in the blood. Sir James Simpson of Edinburgh discovered chloroform. That is, before anesthesia came along. He discovered chloroform because chloroform could put a person to sleep and that way they wouldn't suffer so much from the surgery. But where did he learn that? Sir James Simpson was reading Genesis 2.21 one day and he read the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And Sir James Simpson discovered chloroform as a way to lessen the suffering of those undergoing surgery. He got it from the Bible. All the great discoveries today, if you trace them back, you'll find most of them come from studying the Bible. People got the clues from the Bible. Somebody asked me the other day about oil. Is there oil in Israel? Yes. The Bible says in the book of Joshua that Asher, one of the tribes, will dip his foot in oil. And a Jew read that and he said, since the Bible is true, I will go over there and find that oil. He went over and found out the location of the tribe allotted to Asher and began to dig and he got oil. Got rich by reading the Bible. The Bible is a treasure. Modern medical science says mental health depends upon temperance, freedom of worry, and a contented occupation. By the way, if you've got a job and you don't like it, you ought to quit. It's, it's, it's stressful to work at a job that you don't like. And the Bible actually teaches the same thing. The Bible says temperance in all things, diligent in business, and take no thought of the morrow, what you shall eat or what you shall put on. I won't quote any more scriptures on that. Consider the Bible's relevancy for today's mankind. Most old books are out of date. But I want to give you some scientific medical information. If you had lived during the days that this book was written, it was called the Pharmacopoeia, that's where we get our word pharmacy, Longdensis. Now the book Pharmacopoeia Longdensis sat on every physician's desk. It was his desk physician's book. And he treated his patients from what he learned in the Pharmacopoeia Longdensis. If you practice those remedies today, the AMA would jail you. Take, for instance, med uh, cataracts. They had a, science had a way of getting rid of cataracts, they said. Here's what the book said. The head of a coal black cat burned to ashes, the which being blown into the eye will heal a stain which groweth over the sight. That's science long ago. Medical science. I expect all that did was make the black cats nervous. Then they had one for a broken heart. Now this is a physician's reference manual. A green tea trope, a green tea tree toad burned to ashes in a copper vessel mixed with a tablespoon of vinegar in which has been dissolved a small pearl the entire mess divided into three equal portions and taken after meals, the same will cure a broken heart. And that's a heart stopper for sure. <laughs> I can't imagine science believing that kind of stuff. They did. They had a cure for alcoholism in this pharmacopoeia lombensis. And the doctors would read this when an alcoholic came in for treatment. Eels placed in wine or beer, and suffered therein to die and rot. 
He that drinketh that mixture will never touch that kind of liquor again. I can agree with that. I don't believe he would. Man needs rest. And God provided that in the Ten Commandments. On the Sabbath day, man is to do no work. He is to rest. See, the Bible's right about it. Modern science tells us if you work six days a week and you don't get any rest, you won't last long. And God laid down the Sabbath law for the people for their rest. Leprosy. Today, leprosy is using the same methods that Moses used in his day. They haven't improved much on what Moses laid down. Moses laid down a series of hygienic laws. And the doctors today are following those laws of Moses because they work with leprosy. You can read the book of Leviticus, chapter 14. Then the Bible is botanically correct. I'm not a botanist, but the Bible describes over 250 flowers and plants. And the early botanists classified plants by the Linnean system. But today, the Linnean system has been discarded as the way that one should classify seeds and plants by classifying them as the Bible does by seeds as described in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, 175 year old book on botany which was a scientifically accepted textbook in that day said in Italy there groweth a herb knowing as the basilica which hath a blossom of pure white possessing a rare fragrance yet with all hath this strange property the blossom placed under damp stones and suffered therein to remain for ten days transform themselves into venomous scorpions the bite of which results in death now Moses said a lot about botany but he never stuck his foot in the lard pail like that he had more sense than that because God told him what he should write. The Word of God is right in line with modern botany today. They have actually gone back to the Bible to accept the Bible's classification of plants and flowers by seeds. It is zoologically correct. For centuries, science taught that the buzzards, the vultures, found its prey by scent, by the smell of a decaying carcass. Now they know that is wrong. They know that the vulture has a telescopic eye like the eagle. And they know that he finds his prey by sight, not by smell. But zo zoologically correct, the Bible is. And in Job 28.7, he said, there is a path which no fowl knoweth, and which the vulture eye hath not seen. Meteorologically, the Bible is correct. And by diversity, it is correct. I think I will give you the story of a lieutenant in the Navy. One day he was homesick and his little daughter was reading the Bible to him and she read the 8th Psalm. Now, every ship that goes to sea has a, a pilot house and it has a pilot chart. And on every ship that goes out to sea you will find these words in the pilot charts. They say, issued by the U.S. Naval Hydrographic Office, founded upon the researches made and the data collected by Lieutenant M.S. Mallory, U.S. Navy. That's on every chart, on every ship. 
Mallory heard his daughter read the 8th verse of the Psalms. The fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatever passeth through the paths of the seas. And as he lay there in bed, his little daughter reading that verse to him, suddenly he sat up and said, What did you say? Read that verse again. And she read it again. Passeth through the paths of the seas. He said, the paths of the seas? Up to that time, nobody knew about ocean currents. Nobody knew that there were paths in the sea, in the ocean, that you can chart. And he listened to that verse, believing the Bible, being a Christian, he said there's got to be paths, lanes in the sea. And he found them and charted them. And now every ship that goes to sea has his name on the pilot chart because the Bible showed him something that science had never yet discovered. Paths in the sea. It is chronologically correct it is accurate in every detail, even in its prophetic statements. For example, the Bible never contradicts itself. Now, the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, it will take place in the twinkling of an eye, and it says it will be both night and day when the Lord returns. And the infidels used to scoff at the Bible and say, the Bible's wrong. It says night and day. And that can't be. It can't be night and day. But what they didn't know is when it's night here, it's day on the other side of the world. And when it's day on the other side of the world, it's night over here. Was the Lord Jesus wrong? No. He would have been wrong if He had said it was either night or day only. But He was never wrong. And He said, in that day, he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. One shall be taken, and one other shall be left. Jesus put day and night both in that verse. Why? Because he knew that it would be both day and night for somebody somewhere. Is the Bible up in line with science? It certainly is. It's never been wrong yet. And science did not discover that the world was round until 1600 years after the Gospel was written. The Bible is a book also of diversity. You can find in any field you want scientific literature, poetry, love, adventure, whatever you want, you can find it in the Bible. And it's always correct. It'll never lead you astray. Benjamin Franklin at one time was an ambassador to France. And France, as you know, was a very atheistic nation. And he joined an infidels club who would meet together once a month to read an essay about something that was to be outstanding in literature. And so he went one time and he presented his essay. And what he did was he took the book of Ruth and he had it translated into French. And as he appeared before this group of infidels and read the book of Ruth, oh, they clapped and applauded. They said, where did you ever find that? We must have it so we can get it printed and share it with the world. They said it is beautiful. It is lovely. We want to share it with the world. It needs to be presented to the world. Mr. Franklin said the story has already been printed. It's already been given to the world. They said, well, where has this story been printed? How have we failed to hear about it before? He said, you will find it in the Bible. The book that you profess to despise and about whose contents you know apparently very little. Again, the Bible is always re relevant and it is diverse. 
Did you know that there are modern technological facts that are spoken of in the Bible? For instance, automobiles are spoken of. Nahum chapter 2 and verse 4. The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one another in the broad ways. That's the freeways. And they shall seem like torches. And they shall run like lightnings. The Bible knew all about automobiles long before they were invented. The internet. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. It says, many shall run to and fro. If you don't believe that, go stand in an airport and watch the people coming and going. Many shall run to and fro, Daniel said. And knowledge shall be increased. Everybody has a computer today. Everybody can get on Google and find out anything they want to know just about. Knowledge shall be increased. How did Daniel know that? How did Daniel know about people traveling? How did Daniel know about knowledge? In those days they only went on a camel. In those days they only knew what little bit they had been able to glean. But the Bible knew all about it. Our Lord Jesus Christ is predicted in the Bible as to be sold for silver, betrayed by a friend, forsaken by disciples, betrayed by one who ate bread with him, whose hands and feet would be pierced, who would be given vinegar and gall, whose price of betrayal would go to the potter's field. And his death and his resurrection all predicted in minute detail hundreds and hundreds of years before he was ever born in Bethlehem. An infidel by the name of Bolingsbroke tried to explain prophecies away by saying that Jesus arranged them all. Would Judas go out and hang himself to fulfill Scripture? Would the soldiers gamble because they knew prophecy? Would the Pharisees send blood money to Potter's field? No. I have a little poem that I like to share. It's called God's Word. Written by John Clifford. I paused last eve beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring, the vespers chime. And looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, he answered. Then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears out the hammers, you know. And so, I thought, the anvil of God's Word. For ages, skeptics' blows have beat upon. But though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unchanged. The hammer's gone. Did you know that the infidel Voltaire said, in my lifetime, the Bible will be abolished, it will be extinguished, and nobody will ever read it again. He said that in his house to some visitors. You know what's in his house today? The American Bible Society owns his house today and they have their office in his house. The Bible says Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And in Israel, when they were slaves in Egypt, God told them to slay a lamb place its blood upon the doorpost and the mantle and to go in and close the door and at midnight God would pass over the land of Egypt and he said to them when I see the blood of the lamb I will pass over you and there will be no judgment upon your house and God did pass over that night that Passover night 
and no firstborn in any Israelite house died. But in Egypt, every firstborn son in the land of Egypt dropped dead as God's judgment passed over the land of Egypt. But you see, Israel was in a tight spot. God was testing them. He says, if you put the blood on the doorpost, out visibly where everybody can see it, where the Egyptian soldiers walking by can see it, it was against the law and punishable by death to slay a lamb in Egypt because the lamb was sacred to the Egyptian god, Amen Ra. And they worshiped this false god, Amen Ra. And the symbol of this Amen Ra was this lamb. And therefore, no one dared to ever kill or slay a lamb. And now God says to them, I'm coming over the land of Egypt in judgment. And in every house where there is no blood, the firstborn will die. Judgment will fall upon that house. Now, they must have reasoned within themselves. If we put the blood on the doorpost and an Egyptian soldier walks by, he will arrest us and put us to death. And God says He's passing over the land of Egypt tonight and there will be death if we don't put the blood on the doorpost. You see what God is forcing them into? He is forcing them into making a public profession of their faith in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And they had no choice. Will we die at the hands of an Egyptian soldier? Or will we die at God's judgment? And they had to make a choice. If they were true believers, they would put the blood on the doorpost and not worry about the Egyptians. If they were not true believers, they would be afraid to put the blood on the doorpost. And that night, not a single Israel, Israeli firstborn died. Not a one. But in the land of Egypt, the firstborn in every Egyptian home died, including Pharaoh's son. God does ask for a public profession of faith in His Son. And when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the judgment of God is averted. It no longer will ever reach us. And we have to make a profession of faith. Jesus said, He that confesseth me before men, him will I confess before my Father and his angels which are in heaven. And that's the verse that I was saved on the night I was saved 60 years ago. I gladly walked down the aisle and confessed Jesus Christ to be my Savior. If I had lived in Egypt that night, I would have put the blood on the doorpost. I have already done that. Sixty years ago, by faith, I applied the gospel to my heart. And God saved my soul. Missionary John Payton sailed to the New Hebrides Islands. They were savage tribes. They were cannibals. The British government had first refused to allow him to go. But finally they let him go. And when the ship pulled up to the New Hebrides Islands, they put out a little boat and let him row in. They would not go with him because they were cannibals. They were afraid of them. But he persisted. So he got in a little rowboat and he rowed out. And then, there in the New Hebrides Islands, he began to translate the Bible into their language. His wife died. And because they were cannibals, 
He had to lay on his wife's grave with his dog and his shotgun to keep them from digging up his wife and consuming her. And the British government, 30 years later, congratulated him and said, the cannibalistic inhabitants of the New Hebrides Islands have become the most advanced cultural of all the native tribes. What did that? The Word of God. The Word of God changed that cannibalistic tribe into glowing Christians advanced in culture. That's what the Bible does for men. And I close with this. John Wesley, a famous Methodist preacher, wrote this down one day in his diary. He said, I am a creature of the day passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit coming from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf. A few moments hence, I am seen no more. I drop into an unchangeable eternity. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God Himself has condescended to teach the way. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book. Here, then I am, far from the busy ways of men. I sit down alone. Only God is here. In His presence I open. I read His book for this end to find the way to heaven. So it is. This book, this infallible book, which contains no error, which is true to modern science, wherever modern science is true, is the book that will take you to heaven. It presents a Christ who died that He might take you to heaven with Him. And if you are not saved and you elect by God's grace to turn to Him and trust Him, He will save you. And He will avert the judgment of God from you and you will be safe and saved. May God grant it as we pray. Our Father,